mean, <laughs> all of all of the deacons, um, our chairman, Dean Kenny Smith, maybe Ann Kenny, like to speak to you this morning and this afternoon, right after we're done. But also, all of you, I spoke with uh, Pastor Corbin this morning. Y'all give God a praise. <laughs> everybody. He misses us, but God is working in His life. And I had a great conversation with him today as he was talking and. We just love what was going on. Amen.
There will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves. Lovers of money. Boastful. Proud. Abusive. Disobedient to their parents. Ungrateful. Unholy. Without love. Unforgiving. Slanderous. Without self-control. Brutal. Not lovers of the good. Treacherous. Rash. Conceited. Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Having a form of godliness, but denying its power, have nothing to do with such people. Will you bow your head and pray with me? Father God, again, as we stand before your word, I would never stand without allowing you to come and be in control. Lord, I need you to show up. Lord, touch the hearts of your people. I don't know what's on their mind. I don't know what, what is going to take place in their heart, but you prepared this message because that's your child, and you know how you're going to guide their footsteps. Lord, I bless you today, God, for just showing up and being with us so far in this service and us realizing how precious it is just to say hallelujah yes. in an atmosphere where you are there. So Lord, I ask you to bless this message today. Bless uh, my mind, my heart, my spirit, my soul, but you come and be the preacher. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. So I just need you, because I see where, you know, did somebody called me this morning and said, we're going to the park, not going to the park. Text me, I said, no, I, we sent out enough messages, we're not. But I need you to find somebody you can look at and say, look at me. Look at me. No, look at me. Look at me. All right, I need you to help me out with this message. All right? Repeat after me and talk to that neighbor. Say, neighbor. Neighbor. Oh, neighbor. Oh, neighbor. Thank you, ushers. Thank you, musicians. We're going to speak from the thought. I, I was telling church, I didn't want to say too many get readies because y'all think I was ripping off gigs. So oh. I just said one get ready. Just <laughs> get ready. You know something's coming, so get ready. It was our 16th president, President Abraham Lincoln, who said, if you give me six hours to cut down a tree, I will spend the first four sharpening my axe. Mm -hmm. It was Benjamin Franklin, the one of the founding fathers, a poetic statesman, drafter and signer of the Declaration of Independence, and the first postmaster general who said, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound Amen. of cure. And it was the talk show host, TV network owner, Mongol, television Mongol, Oprah Winfrey, who was worth about $3.5 billion, who said, I believe that luck is when preparation meets opportunity. If you were prepared when the opportunity came, then you got lucky. All of these folks that I'm talking about had one thing they were honoring in those quotes. They were talking about the power and spirit of preparation, of being prepared. And there's a lot of things that will happen in your life that will come when you are prepared. Preparation is not for lazy people. Preparation can be the difference between the type of life you live. If you're prepared, you can live a powerful life. When you're not prepared, you got to take whatever life throws at you. Right. Preparation is high on God's list. And God wants us to know constantly that everything he does is based on how prepared we are. I'm just letting you know that there may have been, I hope nobody gets upset, there may have been some blessings God wanted to lay on you, but because you weren't prepared, he couldn't give it to you. No, uh, a matter of fact, the Bible says that heaven or serving God is for prepared people. So how can God, we wouldn't do that to our own children. How can God give you something that you're not ready to receive? As a matter of fact, I was at Home Depot earlier, last week it was, 
And there was a man who bought a 75 inch television. Now I was doing my shopping, but brothers, you know how we get when we see a 75 inch television. We like to follow the TV, just look at it. I'm following this man as he bought this 75 inch television on sale. What messed me up is when he went outside, I saw him trying to put this 75 inch television in a Prius. Oh. I mean, they tried that thing, they wrestled with it, bought another salesman, tried to tie it to the truck, he opened up the back door, they tried to put the seats down and slide it in, wouldn't fit the trunk. That man left there so disappointed, and he was disappointed because if what he thought was going to be his, the blessing he thought he was going to get, he couldn't get because he wasn't prepared to take it home. Sometimes you come to church, and you don't get the blessing that God wanted you to take home. Help me, somebody. Because you were not prepared and ready for it. You remember the, 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 the uh, parable of the ten virgins? How five were wise and five were foolish, right? And the only difference between the wise ones and the foolish ones was that the wise ones were prepared. And the foolish ones were not. And so then the Bible says, a cry came at midnight, the bridegroom coming. And all of them got up. But the five wise ones were able to trim their lamps. But the ones who were foolish were not able to do that. As a matter of fact, they went to the ones that had their lamp and said, can you please um, give us some of your oil? And he said, I only got enough for me. And then the Bible says in verse 10 of that 25th chapter of Matthew, this verse came up and it blows you, shows you what happens when you're not prepared. It says, and when the while they were out purchasing oil, the, bride, the bridegroom came. Those that were prepared went in with him. But that's not what I want you to see. I want you to see the last line. And he shut the door. Can I tell somebody that because you weren't prepared, maybe last month, last year, there was a blessing you've been asking for. Maybe your mind is driven, has drifted off. But God has shut the door on that blessing. Until you get prepared. Preparation is Something that God wants us to know that he cannot bless us without preparation. As a matter of fact, he called anybody who walks around not prepared foolish. But he also has another name for unprepared people. Go to Proverbs 6, verses 6 through 8, and you'll find these words. Go to the ant, thou slugger. He calls you a slugger. Slugger means lazy. Yeah. Go to the ant, thou slugger. Consider her ways. Um, who has no guide overseer or ruler and yet provides for her uh, meat in the summer and gets her harvest and prepare her food for the harvest. What she's saying is you better work while you got time to do it. You better get prepared while you got time. It's one of those things where you have to understand that God wants you to know that it's preparation that gets you to the point where you can say I'm ready to receive my blessing. What I'm talking about you can look around at the resume of any professional person who you think has made it and it looked like an overnight success but do I have news for you? You can look around this room and think some of us in here have made it. I sure can't wait till I get like you. I got but let me give you the back story. I need you to know no 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 you got to understand there's a whole lot of days ah, where I'm fighting back trying to manage my fear. I know y'all created in Christ Jesus unto good works that he prepared for us. Watch the word. The word ordained means God prepared that. God said there's some blessings I already have for you, but you didn't do your part. Wow. I know you don't like me yet. Give me some prayer warriors in here. So everything God wants to do for us is because we need to get prepared. He said there's some things you know are coming. And what's crazy, you want to get prepared for those. 
That's why this text is about the Apostle Paul prophetically warning Timothy about some things that are going to come to pass. He wanted Timothy to be prepared. And I believe that he was, it was such an uh, emphasization on this text is because he knows that a lot of us know things are going to happen and we still aren't getting ready for the inevitable things that happen in our life. Do you know there's some things in our life that's going to happen and after all these years of pastoring, I still see saints whining about it? Everybody in this place knows there's some inev inevitable things going to happen. You just need to get ready. Right now you're healthy. But sickness is going to hit everybody. And you sit around and act like you want to fall apart when you get sick. And you want to whine about why am I sick? And understand that this body that we're living in is a sinful body. And sooner or later, I might not be sick on this Sunday morning on July 8th, I mean July 9th, 2023. But it don't mean I won't be sick tomorrow on July 10th. All I know is something's coming. I just got to get ready for it. I know I ain't going to stay this healthy always because that's a lie somebody told you. You got to know if sickness going to come, it's going to come.
There's one threat that's greater than anything I talked about. There's one threat Paul's trying to tell Timothy about. There's one threat that can make you backslide, that'll make you turn around and hate God, that'll make you leave the church. And here it is. It's right there in the text. You know what it is? Worldly, carnal minded, demonically led church folk. There's folk in the church that's going to hurt you. So you might as well get ready. He was trying to tell Timothy what he said. He said there's going to be perilous times, and he expressed those perilous times by perilous people. There's some folk in church who just ain't right. And I need you to know, people don't usually leave a church because the church service is too long. They don't leave a church because the pastor can't preach. They don't leave a church. I'm not using prayer ways today. They don't leave a church because they had to pay some time. They usually leave a church because somebody ran them off. Matter of fact, this word just came up about a couple of years ago. Now everybody went around talking about church hope. Church hurt. Church hurt. I tell people, Chip, quick, change that mess. It ain't church hurt. It's people hurt. You just got hurt in the church. But don't give the church a bad name. That's where you got hurt. That's where your sin nature rises up and somebody else's sin nature. I ain't going to shout no more. Too many people hurt you in there. Get my church name out your mouth. Don't make me pull a Will Smith on y'all. Get my church name out your mouth. Oh, around telling you. So we don't know we talk about you. Because the reality is, I'm gonna give, I'm gonna lift three points off of this text, and I'm gonna do it for two reasons. I'm gonna lift the three points, and the first reason is so you can understand who these people are and make sure it ain't you. Wow. That's my first reason. My second reason is so you know how to handle these people when they come up. And I need you to know some of them looking at you right now. Because that's what happened in the church. This was Paul. this was this was the second letter. Paul wrote to Timothy. When he wrote this letter to Timothy, the second letter, I don't know how, how long it was between the first letter and the second letter, but what we do know about this is this was the most personal letter. Because Paul was laying in a Roman jail, and yet by being in a Roman uh, jail, he still had enough sense to be thinking about God. Isn't this something you can tell saved folk when they know that something's going wrong, but they still got their mind on trying to help somebody else out of their situation. And Paul started writing this letter to Timothy, his protege, his mentee, and he wanted to let him know, Timothy, you're getting ready to go to Ephesus, 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 and you're getting ready to uh, 
run that church over there, and I need you to know these are perilous times, and you got to watch the people coming in your church. I did not save many mighty, many noble. No, I saved the base things of the world. I saved the low people. I'm the one who changed them, but you got to learn how to get around with them mm. and get along with them. So I want to lift up a couple things here so we can identify these worldly, carnal-minded, demonically obsessed people that live on the pews. And I need you to know this. The reason I keep calling them people, I can't call them believers because the jury's still out. Right. Because if you keep acting like you're acting, it means you might not be saved. Oh, oh sorry, I need, so I need to point some prayer warnings right here. Y'all ain't with me. So let me tell you what's going on. First of all, he told him, here's the first point. Uh, stand strong in perilous times. Look at the first verse. In the last days, perilous times are coming. The last days. He was warning him prophetically. And I need y'all to know we are living in the last days. How do I know? Because the Bible says so. I'm not just giving you some, you know, willy-nilly prophecy. Look at Hebrews chapter 1, verse 2. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 2, that God in these last days has spoken to us by his Son. God himself said these are the last days. What are the parameters of the last days? From Jesus' ascension until Jesus coming back is considered the last days. And you know what happens in the last days? People get desperate when it's the last of something. The world now is getting desperate. Why do you think our world, y'all know we live in the last days? Because in the world, all the morality is being sucked out of the world. The devil's raising up his head. And the days are getting bad because we're getting close to Christ's return. And when you get to the last of anything, it's going to be a mess. Because now people are desperate. And they will say and do anything. They don't realize we don't have a world that can fight back. What am I talking about? I was in Walmart when the pandemic hit. I'll never forget these two ladies who were up there. And they were asking, where was the hand sanitizer? And I need you to know that I was ear hustling because I wanted some too. But the lady said, there is some on this shelf that we put up. Don't nobody know it's back there. You might want to see if there's some back there. Both of those ladies took off running to get that hand sanitizer. And then later, you know, when you go to Walmart, the, the uh, medicines are right over here. You go to one right there in Millville. And I could hear them back there fussing. We heard them coming out. One lady had grabbed all of them. Oh, wow. And another lady was following her saying, we both heard this. Why don't you share? The other lady said, no, I got there first. Oh, and the other lady, this is a true story. The lady said, I got there first. The other lady said, well, at least you can share with me. She said, no, I need all of this. Wow. I'm going to give some to my daughter and her family. So no, just leave me alone. Well, this time the other lady thought maybe I, I thought I was going to fight, but she raised up her voice level to say, look, I said we both saw the person. You need to share some of that with me. That didn't rock sister girl. She turned around and said, you better hear me. I'm keeping all of this, and you ain't getting none of this. And pretty soon we backed up. I thought they were going to fight over hand sanitizer. But you know why the attitudes change? Because when you get to the last of anything, it gets violent. Come on. Okay, let me give y'all a practical explanation. Uh, you know how when you got a big burger and you got some ketchup and the bottle almost empty? When you got a burger sitting there sizzling and the bottle real full and you smooth that ketchup out, you just as happy. But get that burger sitting on the table where ain't no whole lot of ketchup left. You start banging the bottle on the plate. You start hitting the bottle to the side. Then when that ain't good enough, you get mad to go to the sink and run some water in and shake it up. You try to throw it on your burger. Because when you get to the end, you get desperate. That's what's in the church now, y'all. Desperate, mean folk who hurt other people. And you got to make sure, as Paul was telling Timothy, you got to get ready because it is coming. He said last days. Then he said perilous times. The word perilous is only used four times in the Bible in this form. Here what the four words mean. It's times of rebellion. It's times of being desperate. It means hard times. And it means times of being fierce. There are people, there are spirits running around the church now that are just spirits, and there's some people that hurt you. We all hurt people. That's why I'm, I'm not saying it's, 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 every, it's just one person. But I'm talking about the people that hurt you and know they hurt you and don't care. Jesus. There's a different breed of church, folk, in the church. Y'all want to hear this? Stay with me because here's what the Bible says. First person you got to learn to control is yourself. Y'all yeah. yeah. quit acting like I'm preaching this message about somebody else. Yeah. Right. Hello, somebody. First of all, you got you to gotta start watching what you do. Yes. You got to start watching how you talk to people. You ought to watch how you treat people. Yes. Maybe the blessing didn't come because you haven't watched what you did. And so God is saying the first person you got to control is yourself. You know why? You know why? Somebody say why. You know why? why? Okay. Because you reap what you sow. Yeah. Maybe you just reaping. I know y'all don't. I need to pick it up. You just reaping what you sow. That's why I tell you. When somebody else is sick, pray for that sick person. When somebody else needs healing, celebrate with them. Because when you don't celebrate with somebody else, I'm standing up here. We got a brother that needs prayer. And you sit around like you can't open your mouth. But you know what happens? When you can't bless me in my sickness, when you can't pray for my family, when your family get in trouble, when you get in your sickness, God may give you the same thing you 
you gave out. Yeah. 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 Why ain't they got no blessing yet? I knew this was going to be a quiet message. That's what I'm talking about. Why ain't they got no blessing yet? Because you're reaping what you sell. Jesus. And we wonder why, how we, what I'm saying is, God is saying that what you do count. As a matter of fact, remember Daniel? Uh, in the sixth chapter, and uh, it says that Daniel actually was thrown in the lion's den. Know why he was thrown in there? The jealousy right. of the other advisors. Right. Yeah. Folks don't like it when you're doing well. So what they did is decided they're going to lie on Daniel and put him in the lion's den. Well, when Daniel got to the lion's den, the Bible said the lions didn't touch him. But the next morning, when King Darius got there, he said, uh, Daniel, you okay? He said, yes. Then he said, I'm going to take all y'all who lied on him. Mm. And I'm going to throw y'all in the lion's den. Uh, and the Bible said, if you read the text, it says, before they hit the floor, the lions had shred them to pieces. Don't you know you just read, you're trying to set up somebody else, and what you're trying to set up with somebody else, you're going to end up reading. reading. How many know that's why we learn how to bless God on good days and bad days? Because I learned if I can praise God in the good times, when well, ain't nothing going on, that when it comes to hard times, I automatically got a praise out of my mouth. Are there any survivors in here that will tell somebody? I learned that sometimes I just lift up my hand and tell God, Look, and I know 
And all of this, Job did not sin. There's some of us out there, we don't like what God is doing. We don't know what God is doing. But since we know God is good, we don't lose God. We keep on holding on to God. Is there anybody been in your house and thought, I'm going through too much? I don't know what God is doing in my life. But you still got to hold on. Because when you hold on, somehow God delivers us. Well, I'm just telling you, at the end of the day, I know where my help and my source and my strength comes from. And it is from God. He knew where his source was. So you gotta learn how to stand fast in perilous times because secondly said you gotta learn how to stand fast with perilous people. Uh, that's what this text is about. I'm, I'm right almost like past the middle of my text. Watch this. That's what he said in the next verse. He said, and uh, for men will be lovers of themselves. Uh, he said, um, there's people out there who wanna run you out to church. I'm telling you this now so you don't get shocked, Timothy, when somebody say something wrong to you and want to lose your religion. Mm. As a matter of fact, there's songs written about these people. Yeah. You got to be aware. What's the song? What they doing? <laughs> All, All the time, they want to go back. You know some people do, they smile in your face yeah. and make you think that they like you. Yeah. Then when you're not around, oh, it's so heavy in this place. I love it. When you ain't around, then that's, I'm the first person you're talking about. They be smiling in my face. I give you another look at y'all in old school. Smiling faces. Smiling faces sometimes. They don't tell the truth. So when people smile in your face, all I'm saying is there are people out there that are in the church. And quit calling the church hurt. It is people hurt. And now there's 14 characteristics of these people. Lord Jesus, 14 of them in church. But I, I can't hit all that. We'll be here all day. I'm just going to touch on a few of them. The first one in there. Is the selfish person. People will be lovers of themselves. Right. Woo, we live in self. We got selfies. Right. And so we can do selfies, no need nobody. We got selfie sticks. Right. And so we got selfie sticks. We like to see how many people, how many views I get on my Facebook. We want to check how many followers do I have. It's all about you, but not about God. We got this thing where our self, our self nature always want to be promoted. You got to watch out for selfish people because they love you as long as you're doing what they want you to do. Selfish people are like abusers. You ever live with somebody and you think they love you, then they flip that script on you? See, that's how selfish people get because they feel when they get offended, oh my God, it's the end of the world. And they will tell you off because selfish people don't like when stuff ain't going their way. And so they got to make sure that they let you know, you're going to talk about me, but here's how they're like abusers. After it gets done, they come back. You ever seen the burning bed? After you beat her up, you come back and say, I'm sorry. I didn't mean. I didn't mean. Nah, nah, nah. Then they take you back and you beat her up again. Because some of people only happy when they get what they need. Wow. Yes. Mm. And so some I know, ooh, I was kind of looking at me. But it's not some Remember Cain? Yeah. He killed his brother only because his brother's sacrifice was accepted more than his. He was just. He was saying too much glory on Abel. Let me kill him so I can get my stuff. And how you know? Because when God came to him and said, where are your brother? Am I my brother's keeper? It was like, I'm only worried about me. I ain't worried about him. When you get to the point that you only worry about yourself, something's going wrong in your life. The next one in here is, I'm telling you, get ready. Because the selfish person is the one that's sometimes the closest to you. And the next person is a covetous person. I'm sorry, y'all. This is the person who loves money. I got a baseline for that, too. One of the most famous baselines in R&B. For the love of money, people will lie. Lie to the cheat. For the love of money, people don't care who they hurt or be. A woman will sell her precious body. When you love money, that's why you ain't got no blessings. See, some of y'all don't realize the only reason you don't tithe is because you're covetous. Understand me? Yeah. You think that's your money. So you already talking about my money. And then, as soon as something runs out, you want to run to God to get some money. Help me, somebody. It's business discipline. I knew that there was going to be a quiet. Do you understand something? The only reason you don't give 
is because you don't want to give away your money because that's mine, that's mine, that's mine. And what you're mistaken about is the fact that God is the one who gave it to you. God is the one who can take it away. And I got better news than that. How many know that if I do give it to God, he gives it back to me better than I gave it to him? Press down, shaking together, running over. He said, unless a seed goes in the ground, it's going to be by itself. But it will prosper once you sow it. Yeah. I know you don't like this one. Second Timothy said, for the love of money is the root of all evil. It'll make you wander when you don't have money. And then the, I'm only going to do these three, three together so I can get out of here. Um, after the covetous person, you got the boast, the braggart, or the boastful person, the prideful person, and the person who blasphemes. That's the next three. I'm just going to do them. I want you to see how they're tied together. All three of them are together. The boastful person is a person who, you ever been around somebody? If you did something, they did it better. Yeah. You ever ask somebody, all they want to do is talk about themselves? Yeah. And the conversation get away from them, they turn it back to them. If you say, I did this, they say, oh, you know, I did that too. Because most of people want to brag about what they did because they want the spotlight to stay on them. Right? So that means that your nature is that you want people to know. And then the proud person is a little different. They don't want to brag about what they did. They just want to walk around the church letting you know you know, the way they walk, that they better than you. Oh, wow. You ever see any kind of person in church you can't touch a corner near? Matter of fact, you walk around them because when you go next to them, the way they look at you lets you know. I, they think they're better than you. You ever seen people in church that let people know, you ain't in my lane. Go back to the poor section. I'm up here with all the right folks. All I'm telling you guys is there's some people in church, I y'all like y'all ain't never heard this before, who will make you think, and they ain't doing no better than you. They serving the same God you're serving. They need the same you need, and if they are treating you like that because of the little stuff they got, it could be gone in a flash. Yeah. But they don't know that. So they both. And then the blasphemer is the one who comes along and steals your blessing. You high on God, and they're gonna pull you back. Mm. Wow. You high on God, they're gonna say, Oh, that's good, but you know, like Joe's friend, you know, what, what what you do? Here's what blasphemer does. You're trusting God for a miracle, and a blasphemer will try to talk you out of it. Right. They're the person that will sit around and, and you know and tell you it ain't gonna happen because they want you to feel like they do. You know the blaspheming person is the person. Uh, the blaspheming person is the person that doesn't reverence God and they don't want you to reverence God. I told y'all this. I'm gonna go to my last point. I'm almost there. That when uh, we were in this church, we just got over here. I had two people leave this church because they told me, Pastor Duncan, you're too loud. Oh, wow. Hey, they say you're too loud, making all that noise up there. Why you be cracking all them jokes and laughing and stuff? The anointing flow when you get serious. Why are you so loud? Now, there was a part of me that wanted to answer them right. You know, say, none of your business. I knew that wouldn't help them. I'm just being honest. That's what I'm going to tell them. You know, anyway, because there's people in church who sit and look at you like they're chewing razor blades. But I'm loud because I got a reason to be loud. You don't know where the Lord has brought me from. You don't know what happens in my life when I'm not around you. And I got somebody to tell you, when I give my praise in church, it's because my God deserves my praise. And I ain't about to stop worshiping God because you look at me funny and you don't like me. I know what it is I'm thanking God for. You weren't there when I almost died. You weren't there when it looked like I couldn't make it. You weren't there when the doctor said he couldn't do anything. Where are the people that know my God was there? And that's why if I got to get loud, I'm going to get loud. And if you don't like my loudness, move. Church. I'm trying to pull the power 
out of other people's lives. Don't you let nobody run you out of your church. Yeah. Don't you let what somebody says stop you from serving God. You're going to walk into this church. God got a blessing for you that day. You're going to see somebody and let them steal the very blessing that you want. Because they didn't talk to you right. No, but you ought to tell them, I knew it was coming. And I'm ready for it. The more you mess with me, the louder I'm going to worship God. Yeah. Paul told Timothy, okay, here's the last point. The first point was you got to make sure you stand in perilous times because you got to stand strong because perilous times are coming. Yeah. And I, I need to say that to somebody because when we fall apart, it's because we, I don't know when the next sickness is going to come, but I do know my body going to give in to something. I just got to be ready for when it comes. It's coming. Got to be ready. So then he said, you got to stand against perilous people. Don't let no people mess you up. Come on now. When God has blessed you. And the last point is, you got to learn how to stand strong in your purpose. That's what Paul said in verse 10. Paul said, well, verse 9, he said, but they shall proceed no further. I said, oh, that's an indictment on you. And look, I don't want to be offended by this message. All I want you to do is I want you to go and apologize. I want you to go and change. I'm going to tell you how to change your life around so this ain't you. Paul told Timothy, he was warning. He said, Timothy, look at verse 10. You know my manner of life, my purpose in faith. You fully know my doctrine. First thing that happens is, I know the manner of my life. So, I can't let somebody in church steal what I know only the Lord can give me. So what that means is, the manner of my life is worship. So when I walk through the door, I'm coming in to worship. I don't care what's going on in the back of the church. I don't care what happened last Friday. I don't care what happened in Bible study. I came in to get my blessing. Me and my wife got some goals. There's some things we need for our kids. There's some things we need for our house. I wish I would let you because you didn't talk to me right. Stop me from believing what God had for me. I wish I would let you take five minutes of my worship and make me sit in church like I don't know my God is able. Where are the people that you better shake that stuff off? Don't you let nobody rob you of what was trying to tell Timothy is, it's coming. These kind of folk are in the church. All you got to do is keep your mind on your purpose. Yeah. I want my mirror. So he said, not only, he said, and I also want to be strengthened by my trials. It's right there. He said, suffering, long suffering, love, patience, persecution, affliction. I don't want to become what they are. You don't think there's some people who said some stuff to me that I wanted to say that? You don't think there's some folk in this church who I know needed a cussing out? You know why I didn't cuss them? Because that ain't my purpose. God got too, I got too much at stake to get down to your level. And I will not let you take one moment of my thinking because I'm focused on my journey. Paul said, I fought a good fight. I finished my course. And I know there's a crown laid up for me. I need y'all to know it's coming. It's inevitable. But please stop saying the church hurt me. Get that out your mouth. Church didn't do nothing to you. People hurt you. And if you keep your focus on God, you won't be worried about who hurt you. He said, Timothy, you're a pastor. Y'all stand to your feet. You're a pastor. And I need you to know when you get in there, I didn't do all of them, but if I were to read the rest of them, he said, I need to understand People that are coming down are disobedient to parents. They're unthankful, unholy. They got no natural affection. Truth breakers, false accusers, traitors, heady, high minded lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. They have a form of God. Only mean you just sit here with us, but you deny the power. Because the power of God is what keeps us in line and keep us loving one another. Look at the neighbor and tell him, it's coming. Just get ready. So, don't say this, but I'm saying this so y'all know this. Don't be knocking on my door and talking about somebody hurt you. No, no, no. I'm letting y'all know it's coming. The devil kills congregations because of the worldly, carnal-minded, demonically-led people that don't realize they're hurting themselves.
themselves more than they're hurting you. Oh, let me hit this down. You got to hand the praise for the message today. Oh, let me hit this down. Be honest, be serious. If somebody in this place and you come every week, I tell you something, something's going to happen never. Death is going to come. Are you ready? If you would tell me, Pastor, I'm not saved, but I need the Lord. You know it's coming. Make sure you're ready. Lift your hand right now so we can pray with you. It's easy. God said, all you got to do is confess with your mouth and you will be saved. Is there one that says, I need Lord in my life? Lift your hand. Is there somebody in here backslidden and said, I need to come back to God? Amen. And I will tell you, anybody want to become a member of the church? I'll tell you straight up, God does not like vagabonds. He gave you gifts so you have a place to worship and use your gifts. Seeing none, before I pray, let me just say this to you. You know, when you come to church, God is going to give you what you need. As your pastor, I can't preach all good messages, but I will tell you this. Over the years, I run into at least four people that left our church because somebody talked to them, did something to them that they thought should have loved them. So I'm preparing y'all so we can get this mess out of church. It's coming. Just get ready. Live your purpose. Father God, I thank you today for everything that was said and done. Lord, may our hearts, if this fell on us and we need to repent, may we be repentant. If this fell on us, Lord, and we just need to pray so someone else can be blessed to try to help someone else's life. And bless us with that. But most of all, Lord, just like Paul told Timothy, these are perilous times. We need you. And we know there's perilous people in the world coming into the house of God. Teach us to love them, hold them, and keep serving you. In Jesus' name, amen. You are dismissed.